This is Wickham Sound. Hello everyone, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I am your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly show where we cover local entertainment and arts news. We have a different guest each week to chat with. We play local and unsigned music. We have a regular episode of The Rye Light Zone, which includes either short stories or poetry. And we also have a um, album review from Twangling Jack Ford in the Ilk Shed later on in the show. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You can also email me here on the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk and I particularly want to hear from people who have artsy stuff to share, mp3s, all that kind of stuff, uh, as well as local news and anyone who thinks they might be a good guest. So we're going to go straight on into this week's episode of the Rye Light Zone and spoiler alert, this is also the guest we're going to be speaking to later on in the show. So we chatted to musician and writer Franz Ellul and as part of that we asked if he'd share a small reading with us for the Rye Light Zone. So here it is, over to Franz Ellul. Conspiracy of Shadows Shadow 2 Where is Shadow 6? Not yet back from detachment, sir. Hmm, not awfully convenient. Still, I suppose we can wait a minute or two. The shadows glanced at each other with some nervousness. It was hard to make out what each shadow was thinking. They were so dark. There had been murmurings about the new range of artificial lights. Not a lot like the sun. In fact, Nothing like the sun. Pathetic, some shadows said. Fuzzy, others said. The kind of shadows offered quite nice and other meaningless platitudes. Shadow Six sneaked across the atrium so silently that he seemed to materialise out of thin air. Shadow Six, behave yourself. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. I will, sir. The usual chuckles rose, then faltered, confidence failing as quickly as a passing shadow. Chief, what's the plan? All in good time, number two, all in good time. What I can say is that DIM 7 has already made the global announcement. She made it quite clear that this is a one-off, permanent, no-going-back change. Anyone not with us is a traitor. One of the others. A traitor. You could almost detect a scowl in the chief, if such a thing were possible in a shadow. It was noon. The allotted time. The chief led them out. Each shadow, following the plan, took position behind selected statues of the others. Then, as the sun moved in its grand orbit, the shadows slowly detached themselves from the statues. All except one. Shadow six the shadowless statues began to crumble, unable to sustain themselves without their shadows. All except one, Shadow Six's statue. The other shadows huddled round the chief, free but afraid. What now, chief? What do we do? Can't we? Can't we just... Uh, no going back now, everyone. Just keep calm. Dim 24 should be arriving shortly with fresh orders. It will all be fine. All fine. You'll see. The one statue looked down and held out her hand, her arm moving with the grace of a ballerina. Shadow Six clasped the elegant hand. I'll never leave you again, my darling. I know. I know. They smiled at each other. Meanwhile, the huddle of shadows, waiting for dim 24, without a fuss, perhaps without even realising, began to grow faint, lighter, 
thus definite. Shadow Six and the statue turned to look at an empty patch of grass. I wonder what happened to Dim 24. Feather Liver sausage? Certainly, sir. The iceman turned and sat at a table, fiddling with his phone and sipping his ice tea. Minutes later, a waiter brought his meal, liver sausage on a bed of lettuce with whole grain toast. Three years old, reminiscing. He was always doing that. He so missed his precious little darling, her big blue eyes, the way she said, Daddy, the colourful picture books. The beep of the text message nudged him back to his desperate, awful life as a tear, floating like a feather, rolled down his cheek. He wiped his eyes. Enough. The waiter glanced at the uneaten food and the back of the stranger as he shuffled through the door. Ice man, ice tea, icy heart. It wasn't always like this, not always. Still, her life goes on and death. Cloudless sky, good, dark, good, key, good. He passed the aviary, slowly, carefully. Some of the birds shuffled, like him, uneasily, dreaming. Do birds dream, have regrets, feel despair? Who knows? The key found its lock. Too easy. He found his target. Too easy. Just pull the trigger. Too easy. Daddy. The image stopped him short. The bedside picture, a beaming, happy father with his beautiful little daughter. His hand shook. The target stirred. Dreaming? A happy dream? not like his dreams. The night sky looked down without pity on a man bent with the weight of his own despair, shuffling along, sobbing quietly. The ice man, melting. Kate, there's a dent in my Volvo, you idiot! Why don't you look where you're going on that thing? Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to. Just fell off. Sorry. Well, sorry's not good enough, young lady. Where are your parents? Where? It's just me and Dad at home. Just us. Hmm, I see. Well, let's go. Your dad will have to pay for repairing the door. Come on. After you. Well, come on. Kate reluctantly picked up her skateboard and limped off, rubbing her shoulder. Dad's on benefits. You ain't got no money to pay for your car, mister. Honest. We'll see about that. Come on, hurry up. They made their way through the teeming crowds of Saturday shoppers. Dad! Hello, love. Just been to get some bread for your dinner. Volvo man looked at Kate's father, struggling with arthritic hands, a plastic shopping bag and a walking stick. He was leaning against an elm tree, dropping leaves in the wind. Um, uh, your, your, your little girl's had a fall, a bit of a bump, but I think she'll be all, all, all right. Should be. Oh, thanks, mister. Thanks. Thanks. Volvo man turned and walked away, his head bent. 
twin. The twins were asleep, but one was restless. She woke up. Mummy. More than a whisper, less than a shout, but still full of anxiety. The mother, Julie, appeared in seconds and picked up the troubled child. What's the matter, sweet pea? Don't want to go to sleep. Not just yet. But you need your rest, sweetheart. Tell you what, shall we have a little drink together? The other twin was dreaming. A dream of deserts and dust, night and stars, an oasis none could find unless gifted with visions of glittering lakes in the ancient moonlight. She looked down at her hands, tied together with a scarlet, silken thread. Better, darling, a bit. Well, let's pop you back to bed so you can... Mummy, I need scissors. Scissors, sweetie. Silence. Yesterday it was a compass. Why do you need scissors? Because... She fell into deep sleep. A pair of brightly coloured scissors on her bedside table next to a silver compass. Thank you. The scarlet silken thread settled on the sloping sand. Shall we wake up now? It's time. That was Frank Zellel sharing some of his work and we're going to be chatting to him after the break. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and it's time for a little bit of music. So this is Stray 8 with their cover of Mustang Sally.
street, at your supermarket, or in your park is highly likely to have COVID-19. This is a national health emergency. Around one in three people have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. So it's critical we stay home. Don't meet anyone outside your household or support bubble except for exercise. Only go out if it's essential. Stop the spread. Stick to the rules. If you bend the rules, people will die. Stay home. Protect the NHS. Save lives. Hiya, Bucks. That's not just me saying hello. Hiya, Bucks is a magazine and website for Buckinghamshire. Exploring the county, seeing the sights, meeting the delightful people and keeping up to speed with what's going on. We support local artists and producers, visit tiny libraries, meet ballet dancing estate agents and give away bottles of gin. Can you bear not to join in? Follow Hiya Bucks on social media. For daily readings, go to HiyaBucks.com and look for the free Hiya Bucks glossy magazine. Love WhatsApp? Love Wickham Sound? Use WhatsApp to message us. Just send your message to 01494 44900. Go on, give it a try. Bohemian Poker by Franz Ellul, and before that we had Stray 8 with their version of Mustang Sally. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM, Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with the man himself, Franz Ellul. Okay, well I thought if we can get started, the first question, which is one that I ask everybody, which is, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Okay, well, I read um, all sorts of things, and I play the game Go, which you might have heard mm. It's called the um, ext- an extreme mind sport, a bit like chess, but not like chess. And anyway, the book is called The End Game, and it's about um, the last stages of a game of Go, which is a board game. <clears throat> it's also the national game of Japan, by the way. Yeah. And it's about how to handle, as I was saying, the closing stages of a game, because you can um, go terribly wrong. You might be winning and just mess things up right at the end. It's a bit like a marathon where, you, where you're in the lead. But if you've not judged your pace properly, you become exhausted and people, you know, overtake you and then you lose. So yep. it's full of um, things to study and lots of problems. So it takes an awful long time to read such a book. You know, mm, I can imagine. <laughs> it's not, not like reading. It's not like, um, you know, uh, a trashy novel for an aeroplane. Yeah, Mil- Mills and Boone or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's something you really have to study. So it, it, it yeah. took me time to go through the whole thing. Um by, by the way, you, I think you're going to ask me maybe later about workshops I've been running. And mm. one of the 
which is about the game of Go. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, because I'm I've I've heard of Go because um, it was it was in the news a couple of years ago that um, that that, that, that uh, AI an AI software had beaten the world's Go champion, and for a long time people say it, were saying it was going to be impossible because uh, with something like chess. Um, mm. There are, there are like, I mean, there are still millions upon millions of combinations, but with Go, there are, you know, billions and trillions. And uh, a lot of the best Go players say it's almost uh, kind of instinctual. And so I think they actually, for this AI, they had to try and mimic human instinct from um, with, within mm -hmm. an AI software, which is fascinating to me. Well, that's absolutely right, Dane. And you, you probably know, because you, you seem pretty knowledgeable about everything, is... Um, the then world champion some years ago was Gary Kasparov. Mm -hmm. and the computer beat him, but it yep. took 19, nearly 20 years before a computer or artificial intelligence could beat a Go professional. Yeah, And as you also might know, um, Lee Seydol, who was probably the greatest player maybe of the last 15 to 20 years, who mm -hmm. won multiple world championships, he had a five-game match against um, a Google, Google Mind, I think it was called. And he thought he'd win 5-0, but he lost 4-1. But he did beat the, the artificial intelligence once, which is fantastic. Because yeah. after that, the, the actual current world champion played uh, the computer and lost everything. Wow. Well, I guess with these these machines, though, they get better as well. So that could in part be why, you know, they, they learn from each game that they play. Exactly. And the latest version of that computer that beat Lee Seydol and the Chinese current world champion what? taught itself and it played itself millions of times, millions of times. So it is far stronger now than any professional. In fact, it's been called the God of Go. So most <laughs> now won't play this so there's no point because we can't beat a machine that's yeah. taught it against itself millions of games you know yeah because no human being would ever have the lifespan to play that same number of games exactly mm. and the game the professionals in the top tournaments they have 10 hours each on their clocks so professional yeah. at the at the highest level takes 20 hours yeah, it's Just an, in, almost an endurance thing as well. Exactly. Mm. Cool. Okay, so uh, one of the main things I want to talk to you about today is obviously uh, your music. So I wondered if you could uh, int sort of introduce yourself and your music and um, yeah, tell us where, where you got started with uh, playing the harp. Oh, well, um, well, some year, well, I was quite young and I was watching telly and the lady came on who was playing the harp. And instead of having it on her shoulder, which is the correct way, she had it kind of way down. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was told to do that so they could see, you know, see her properly. Anyway, her name was Mary O'Hara. I don't know if you've heard that name. She's quite famous in her time. Um, anyway, she was playing the harp and singing, and she'd won a singing competition as well. Very good soprano singer. And it was like falling in love, not with her, not with the singing, but with the harp. And even at that very young age, I thought, I want to do that. And of course, it wasn't until I'd um, started working and could afford to save some money that I could afford to buy a harp. So in my mid-20s, before I could afford to buy my first harp, long time waiting. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. And um, so, I mean, how, how many harps have you owned throughout the years? Uh, well, I've got a, a new harp which I got about a year ago, and I had to wait nearly four years for that mm. because the, the guy who makes them, Mark Norris, up in um, Peebles near Stobo, or Stobo near Peebles, I don't know which way around it is, mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, very much in demand. He makes fantastic harps. His wife is Sabrina Stevenson, and she's a um, very famous, well-known Scottish harp player. So he makes harps for her and harps for other professionals, and luckily... Mm. I went up to his uh, workshop to actually design my own harp. So my harp is my heart's desire because yes. I decided everything that I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got um, several harps. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed to say how many. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, it's like guitars. You can never have too many guitars. 
I'm glad you understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and one of your harps is called Anwen, and that's also the name of your EP. So I wondered if you could chat a little bit about that and how the two, you know, how the two relate together and where the name comes from. Okay, well, um, so again, some years ago, I've got some friends who live in Swindon, and I visited them very often. They're quite close friends. And one day uh, they took me to visit their local um, vicar, I suppose, uh, ecumenical. So it wasn't a particular church. Mm -hmm. And so I met him and his wife and his children. He had three daughters and a son. And the eldest daughter was called Anwen. They're all beautiful children, but I particularly like the word, the name, Anwen. It's mm -hmm. a Welsh name. And when I got my first harp, Anwen, it didn't have a name. And I thought, well, I can't give it a name until I know what she's called. And then one day it was as if the harp spoke to me and said, I'm Anwen. <laughs> so then she became called Anwen. Mm. And my album, my present band album is called Anwen. Uh, my band is called Anwen. And the first tune I wrote using Anwen, my harp, is also called Anwen because I... I always have Anwen in my bedroom and the last thing I do before going to sleep, I play Anwen because it's relaxing and, you know, mm. gets sleep. And one day I went up, sat down, put my hands on, on, on the strings and my fingers started playing something. I thought, where did that come from? And that, and so it's as if Anwen, my harp gave me that tune. So that mm. tune called Anwen. <laughs> you can see I'm obsessed with the name mm. Anwen. <laughs> yeah that's awesome though and um and again i think you so you mentioned it's a, a welsh name did you say yes it's welsh because because um, obviously what, one of the things that um sort of strikes me about your music as well as a lot of it is uh celtic uh inspired or sort of inspired by old myths and legends and stories and that sort of thing so it's quite a nice uh you know quite a nice little round circle there i think yeah and can i just mention i uh, said anwen is welsh name <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And of course, I looked up what it meant, and the most common translations are very beautiful, fair, pure, white. And for me, I think that sums up um, the magic, ethereal sound of the harp, especially the Celtic yeah. harp. I like, I like concert harps as well, but they're mainly, there's lots of metal in a, in a concert harp, mm -hmm. whereas Celtic harps are wooden, made of wood. And I just love the sound. I love I love listening to other people playing the harp, mm. you know, just me because it's nice to just listen rather than play as well. Cool. So, uh, what are some of your favourite pieces of music to play? Okay, now <clears throat> I've got two favourite pieces. Originally, I had one favourite piece, but then another one was added, and mm. my original and still favourite piece is called Moira Dahl. Uh, Moira in Irish means blind. So, sorry, D Dal means blind. Moira is their equivalent of Mary. So Moira Dal, Moira blind. So it's blind Mary in English. Just a beautiful, yeah. beautiful tune. On a couple of occasions when I played Moira Dal to a small number of people, people who started crying. Mm. Seriously. It's such no, an emotional. I can imagine that. Yeah. And the reason I think it's emotional is, is it's written by Terlo O'Carolan, who was an um, itinerant blind Celtic harper mm. who went around w w with a friend on horses playing to the great houses in Ireland, both Protestant and Catholic, and he composed tunes. And although he, was bl he went blind at 18, and he was given a, a, a teacher for three years, and once he'd learned to play whilst blind, which is amazing, mm. um, off he went playing to people. And somebody suggested he should compose rather than just play tunes that everybody knew. So he did compose. And one of them was Blind Mary. <clears throat> but because he was blind, um, he composed this piece for another harper. And someone who plays the Celtic harp is called a harper, by the way. Mm -hmm. Someone who okay. plays the Celtic harp is called a harpist, you know. Anyway, he composed this piece for another blind harper called Moira or Mary. Hence, he called it Moira Dahl. So it's full of compassion and understanding of what it's like to be blind and yet still express yourself through the harp. So it's full of love and compassion. And when I play it, because it's in the music, I think however well or badly I play it, 
the love and the compassion and, and the sympathy, if you like, the humanity just comes through and it affects people and people look sad, you know, and as I say on a couple of occasions, people started crying. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. And um, what, was, what, what was the other piece of music? The second piece <clears throat> is Mna uh, Na Herin, which translates as Women of Ireland. And I used to, th I thought it was a traditional pr piece, but it's actually composed by Sean Arreda, who uh, lived in the 20th century. I think he died in the 40s or 50s, an Irish composer. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful tune. Um, and it's been played by various people mainly women and sung by there, there's also a poem that's been put to it and it's just a fabulous piece if you look it up on the internet okay. you'll see the various versions jeff beck played it with one of the cores um right. uh, who played the violin and he played it with her and it's just fabulous so if you like jeff beck mm. you know look that i like the cause well. <laughs> cause and the cause yeah yeah, yeah. cool and um, so on your album, then, I, I suppose you have a mixture of, um, you know, traditional pieces and original compositions, right? That's exactly right. <clears throat> mm. There are two, two original compositions by me. One is Anwen, which you've yep. obviously read before. And by the way, on my first band album with my previous band is the original version of Anwen. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But I, I recorded it again uh, because... There's a lots of impro improvisation in the tune. There are lots of things I wrote, but I left lots of spaces for improvisation. And on the second version, there are improvisations by Philippa Schofield in my band, and also by Chris Conway, who features on the first album. He was in my band then. And he also features on my solo albums, of which there are three. And they both improvise around the tune. And it's also fabulous what they do. So, as I say, there are two um, original compositions by me. And when is the first one, which I just mentioned? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the second one is Gelich and Gra, which is Irish, translates as Moon of Love. Um, and that's the favorite piece that I've composed. I composed it for my partner, Jean. She'll be embarrassed when she hears this <laughs> on the radio show. She's always embarrassed when I, when I say I compose this <laughs> for Jean. Um, She's so your muse. She's my muse and I love her dearly and I miss her so much. I've not seen her for a year because of the pandemic, you know, mm. though I tend to play, play um, that tune when I miss her because it reminds me of her. Mm. So th those are two by me and I got Philippa to contribute three original compositions for the Anwen album. In fact, you played one of her tunes. You played Bohemian Polka some time ago. Mm. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. The one which is so lively and full of joy. Yeah. And two of hers are one called Ariane Rod, which is based on Irish mythology, which, which we might talk about later. And then she also uh, composed a piece called Song Solo, a solo piece on cello, which is absolutely wonderful, called Song for Abraham. Um, and on the album, there are three by O'Carolan, who I've mentioned already. <clears throat> They're Planks the Irwin, Eleanor Plunkett and Moira Dahl, which we've talked about. Yeah. There's a traditional Irish tune which you may know called Carrick Fergus. Yeah. Do you know that one, Dane? Uh, I think so. I know the name of it. It probably it's one of the. Yeah, I'd have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> and I included a traditional Manx tune, Nikiri Fognati, which translates as the sheep under the snows. And that's about a very bad winter where there was very heavy, very heavy snowfall. And the whole herd of sheep were submerged under the snow because it was so deep and they all died. Mm. Very, and there's a lot about that, that particular winter and that particular event. So that's a very sad tune. And finally, there's a tune which I call E Poor, which I put together improvisations from me based on uh, some Breton themes and then two Scottish tunes, which I interweave. So that's quite a complex piece, but it's one of my mm. favourite as well. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Franz Elul, and here is another one of his tunes. This is Anwen, which is named after his harp.
Anwen by Frank Zellor. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with Frank Zellor himself. Over to Frank. Uh, you've mentioned like some of your different band members as well, but uh, what struck me as well is that quite a few of them are uh, artists, so haven't you used some of their art as album covers and things as well? Uh, well, sort of. Um, the, the, the album cover for the Anwen album was mm-hmm. done by Martin Herbert. Now, he was in my first band, which is called Harps of Avalon. Actually, not yeah. my first. My first, my recent band before Anwen. I've had bands before. Um, and he did all the artwork on that, and that's absolutely fabulous. And he also plays mm-hmm. violin on the Anwen album. Um, what can I tell you about? Well, Annie, who, who replaced Philippa. Philippa became so busy. She's, she's a concert cellist. Right, yeah. And we had a rehearsal uh, once, and I think she's either in Japan or Germany, and she couldn't play loudly enough in those countries to be heard at our rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> so, if only. <laughs> only. Uh, yeah. So she wrote to me, because she was in such demand as a classical cellist, yeah. she really had to leave us. However, she did say that when she's available, she would play at our performance and has done a couple of times and I'm hoping at our next um, charity concert in November, assuming that goes ahead, she'll be able to play with us. But Annie took her place. So at a couple of concerts, they were both there, which is absolutely fabulous to have both of them there. Mm, But Annie is an artist and she paints and she was supposed to have an exhibition in Henley on Thames in January, but because of COVID that had to be postponed. So we're hoping, or she's hoping, so am I, that's going to be in October. Cool. Something uh, to look forward to, hopefully. Yeah, and Tar- Tarsim is a creative writer as well. And although Philippa hasn't admitted it to me, she probably writes and paints. <laughs> I'll have to nail yeah. her. On. They're, all, they're all talented artists. And as Philippa w- will say, <clears throat> if you're a creative artist, as you are, you don't just do one thing. You want to do lots of different things. So you can write, yeah. you can do music, you can do sculpture. You can do all sorts of different things because you don't have to restrict yourself to just one thing. Yeah, <clears throat> for, for sure. And you yourself, uh, you, do, you do your fair share of writing as well. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> um, yes, well, I've always written and I've always written poetry in particular. I think I started... I did a two or three prose pieces when I was at school. And also at school, I used to write poetry as well, because of course we had to study poetry. And, yeah. that, and, it, and when you read poetry, you think, I want to do this. And it encourages you to, to do that. So over the years, I've written quite a lot of poetry. And with the kids I teach, and I teach kids with mental health difficulties, I teach creative writing because that's the best way to improve all forms of writing. And I've proved it because all the kids who do creative writing with me, when they do cr- transactional writing or descriptive writing or reports, that improves no end. So I always do creative writing with all the kids I teach, even the ones doing GCSE, because it because at GCSE level, you probably know, in all the two exam papers for GCSE language, you have to do different pieces of writing. Yeah. And you do lots of creative writing for me or with me, always do better in all the writing bits they have to do. Um, so I enjoy it. It's, um, it gets things out of your head. And at the workshops I do at the art center, which I think you've mentioned already, they yeah. stop for a moment. Um, what I've found is everybody enjoys doing the same creative writing activity together. Because if you're on your own doing creative writing, like some you know published writers are, it's a job and you have to sit down at eight o'clock in the morning, 
work till lunchtime, have a lunch break, then work from half past two to six o'clock or whatever it is. It's a very lonely, they always say it's a very lonely occupation. But yeah. I like it as a social occupation, a social event. And all the people, and there's about 30, 31, 32, who come to my creative writing workshops, all of them say, without exception, they really enjoy writing in a group where everybody's writing rather than doing it solo at home. Yeah. So I enjoy yeah, for it. Sure. And one of the hints I give them, I give them 10 hints about creative writing. One of them is the subconscious wants to see the light. And what I found is when I do my creative writing, things come out of my subconscious mind that I never knew was there. Yeah. And, and also with the kids I teach, because they've got mental health problems, again, they're not aware of it, but some of what's in their minds comes out on paper. And it gives me a better understanding of what the mental health issues are. I mean, I'm, I'm not a um, clinician, so I don't interfere with their mental health. I just teach them. But it does give me an insight onto how I can better help them become yeah. more settled in themselves. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, so you mentioned, obviously, you do you do workshops. Uh, so you do them at the art centre. You do them at schools and colleges. Uh, and also, uh, so I know, you know, as a performer with your harp, you, you do corporate events and weddings. You've done festivals. So I wondered what are some of the most uh, memorable events or workshops that you've hosted? Well, we're, we're with my previous band, Harps of Avalon. We played at the British Diversity Awards, which are held oh. annually. That's to reward or encourage companies that foster di diversity in their workforce mm -hmm. uh, to combat stereotyping and racism, if you like. Um, so we played there, we performed there, and there I, and this is what makes it memorable. I met the then Liberal Democrat leader, Charles Kennedy. Okay, so, yeah. You may remember him. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. And, and I also met Joan Armour Trading. Oh, is, wow. Yeah, exactly. I never thought I would. So that was <laughs> one. And, of course, we gave them the, the, our band album at the time uh, called The Seven Harps of Avalon, which you haven't got yet, have you? Mm, not yet, no. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring, bring that around and, uh, as well as the other albums which you haven't got, because I, I know you're interested. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, so that was quite cool. memorable. And um, I also played <clears throat> at WOMAD, <clears throat> Tarsim Kalyan, who's in my band, my present band, and was mm. in Harps of Avalon. He was booked at WOMAD with his tabla troupe. And because we were playing as a band, he said, oh, come along and play with us. So I did. But you can imagine there were, I don't know, a dozen to 15 tabla players, mainly youngsters that he'd taught. <clears throat> Um, and me on the harp <laughs> and I wasn't amplified so I don't <laughs> think anybody could hear me however I also played in all the venues like smaller tents uh, where people could hear me of course as, as I'm sure you know going to festivals there's always loud noise all the time mm. but, uh, and I can't play the harp very loudly with that amplification so people yeah. had to come very close to me to hear so I did I did perform on the harp at WOMAD and also I went to a storytelling session because I, you know, I was, a, I'm a storyteller as well. Yeah. I wanted to listen to some storytellers, but the storyteller who's booked for three days didn't show up. So I ended, <laughs> I ended up, I checked with the WOMAD people. I ended up doing three story storytelling sessions at WOMAD, which of course yeah. I never imagined I would be doing. Yeah, that's so, fantastic born music at WOMAD and I've done storytelling at WOMAD yeah. and again like I said I never imagined I'd be doing that yeah for sure that's interesting as well because that sort of shows you know the power of sort of saying yes to things and taking opportunities because you could quite easily have missed missed out on that entire experience you know precisely yeah I mean mm. I never dreamed of being booked for WOMAD so I yeah. never but because Tarsim was booked he said oh come along perform with us so yeah. that, that, that was, uh, again, I said, how could I say no to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So I want I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you um, specifically, I suppose, about um, the stories that you tell. Uh, yeah. My first question, my first question is, what can you tell us about the three kinds of music that were first played on the uh, on the harp, the Celtic harp? <clears throat> 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, in Celtic mythology, um, it's polytheistic. There's a god called mm-hmm. the Doida, although it's spelled the Dagda, but it's pronounced the Doida. He was the good god uh, of the Celtic gods. And he was a king within the fairy, fairy race, what we'd call a fairy race, not quite the right word for it, but most people would understand if you say fairy race. Mm-hmm. Then there's a Tuha de Danan, again, which you might have come across. <clears throat> and the Doida had a, a magical and enchanting harp, which he took everywhere with him. It was told, stolen once, uh, but it came to him when he called, called it. Um, and his harp, this is where the idea of the three musics comes from. His harp had what was called the three noble strains of music bound into it. Um, so each property or each strain had a, a different effect on the listener. So these are the three musics. And the first one of the three was called the Goltra or Goltrai or the sorrow strain, <clears throat> which caused people to weep. A bit, a bit like when I play more. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> I, I play that according to Goltra, you know, and then the, yep. and the the Gayantra Ge- or Gayantrai, there are different ways of pronouncing it, and I'm not an expert. And it's called the joy strain, and it causes laughter or merriment. So it's to help, it encourages people to laugh. And then there's Suantra or Suantrai, and that is a, it's, called, it's lullaby or the sleep strain. And you use that when you want, when you're learning people to sleep. So those are the three musics. And I, I don't always think of those strains when I play, but I do when I play Moira Dahl. I think Goltra, yep. a strain. And some very, very kind of lively uh, tunes, I kind of play with Gentra in, in my yep. mind. Yeah. Well, and one thing um, that, that I noticed on your site that you do as well is like um, guided meditations, right? So presumably the third strain would be ideal for something, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Now, it's interesting you should ask that because I haven't done it for a while, partly because mm. of um, uh, the lockdown, but partly because I prefer to do it to groups. Yeah. And I used to do quite a lot of um, festivals, but they've gone into some kind of decline, unfortunately, partly because, well, some friends of mine used to run festivals in Wickham, Aylesbury and Milton Keynes. But then the race to hire these places was doubled. And, and they couldn't afford to book these places because they just make a loss. And I was really sad because I used to do guided meditation to, to groups. It works best with groups. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and what I do, uh, guided medita- meditation is basically a journey. You start from somewhere, end up somewhere, and then you take people back. And I do it with the, with the harp, of course. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of Suntra, the lullaby harp. Because yeah. it encourages people to close their eyes and go deep into, you know, into themselves, as it were. And yeah. I did the session with a friend of mine, Joe. Um, so they did the yoga session and they were all on their mats. <clears throat> and they all wanted to lie down on their mats. I said, that's fine by me. Some sat cross-legged. And I did the um, guided meditation, which I took them into the journey, then brought them back. Most of them fell asleep, which is quite normal, because it's Suantra music that mm-hmm. I play on the harp. And, but at the end of it, most of them were female. There are few males, not many males, but most of them were females. And at the end of it, I think there were at least three, may, maybe more, maybe four, were crying. Mm. And I said, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry. Um, and, but, but what happens in a guided meditation, if people relax and you know close their eyes so that they're not just noticing being distracted by everything around them they tend to either fall asleep or go into into a level of meditation which is what it's all about but it means they go into the subconscious mind so when i take them on the journey that's what happens to not to everybody but then i kind of bring them back to the the living world and but the the ones who cry they said no 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 it was good crying because it made me mm. think things that were deep in my mind that I hadn't thought about for years. And some of them related to some of the imagery. I won't go into too much depth. Some of them related to the imagery in the guided meditation, which they found very powerful. Yeah. Um, so some of them um, wanted 
my CDs so they can play the CD and meditate for themselves. Mm. But oh, after, afterwards, my friend Joe said to me, she advised me to tell people before doing the guided meditation, particularly in a group, that they might go into a like a deep sleep and go into the subconscious mind and might get emotional. So to be aware that at the end of the guided meditation, when they, as it were, wake up, when I bring them out of their meditation, they might feel quite emotional. So when I do it, and I've not done it probably for two, three years, I always give a like a health warning, say, yeah. you, know, you might get emotional when you come out of it. <clears throat> oh, cool. Cool. Um, and just one or two questions just to end on. Uh, I w- wondered, uh, what are some of your favorite stories from mythology? from any mythology as well, because I know you do, you do Celtic, but also obviously Greek mythology. I think you do yeah. a wide variety. So what are some yeah. of your all time favorites? Okay. Well, I think I mentioned the two had the Danon already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a series of stories about the two had the Danon. And as I said, especially ancient Celtic mythology was polytheistic. They believed in lots of gods, not one God, but yeah. lots of gods. And they used to elevate I suppose over time, people with wonderful skills into a kind of godhead, even shoemakers, you know. Yeah. Wow, fantastic shoes, they must be a god, you know. And there's one story about um, the Tour de Danon where the gods had to roam the land and gain um, gain their livelihood by doing things. So they started making shoes and they made the best shoes and people mm. became jealous. Um, anyway, there were the two Hudadanan, who were the goodies, if you like, and there were the Formorians. And those that series of stories forms the basis for the text, the Battle of the uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Mag Ture. Uh, and the two Hudadanan represent the functions of human society, such as kingship, crafts, crafts such as shoemaking that I mentioned, mm. and war, you know while the Fomorians represented chaos and wild nature. So it's very interesting how the stories, particularly the Celtic stories, not only, but particularly, kind of um, showed archetypes of human nature. And Mm. I find that absolutely fascinating. And as a side issue, it made me think of um, Leonard Cohen. You know Leonard Cohen? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I like Leonard Cohen. In some of his songs and some of his poetry, because I, you know, I've got, obviously I've got both. He uses archetypes and archetypal images, and I find that very powerful too. As in, as in the line, the peacock spreads his fan. What a line that is in the song! You know, just it just hits you as so yeah. very powerful because it uses archetypes. And there's, as you say, there are stories from all around the world, which is absolutely fascinating. I love them. Just love them. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Do you find yourself when you're on, you know, when you're on holiday, looking up like, you know, the local uh, uh, legends and mythology and things like that? You're absolutely right, Dane. You're beginning to know me too well. Whenever <laughs> we go there, I I always end up in a bookshop and a record shop, mm. particularly vinyl record shops because they're fabulous. And I'm I always look for local legends. For example, we went to Iceland, and I got yeah. some oh, yeah. some legends from Iceland. Um, where else? I haven't got. I don't think I can, I've got African ones. As well. Oh yeah, African ones would be fascinating, and uh, yeah, I can imagine the Icelandic ones being interesting as well. I, I don't know too many. I know um, there is uh, there's the Icelandic um, Christmas tradition where they give uh, books on Christmas Eve. I know that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, which is a great tradition. <laughs> That's interesting because a lot of Icelandic people are also writers. I've heard that, yeah. But I would say apparently between 40 and 50 percent of Icelandic adults have published at least one book, which is amazing. Mm. I, I wish we could be like that in England. Yeah. But I'm doing my best to catch up with them. You know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we can drag the, drag the average up. Encouraging people to write. Yeah. 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 Cool. Perfect. And uh, one final question. I, I suppose it's two, but um, what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to find out more? Well, the first thing to say is my website, as you probably found out, is extremely out of date, extremely out of date. Um, and a friend of mine who does do websites said, no, don't bother with updating your web- website. Do WordPress. 
Now, do you know about WordPress, Dane? Yeah, yeah, I've used WordPress before. Well, I know nothing about it, so I've got to get back to him. Say, okay, tell me about WordPress and tell me what to do. So that's going to be, it hasn't started yet. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to get, get back in touch and say, okay, well, <clears throat> how do we convert the website to WordPress and update it? So unfortunately, yeah. it is out of date. It, it shows what I do. It's, it's got a lot about the stories I, and, you know, from different countries and traditions that I tell. But in terms of what I'm up to, it doesn't have, I don't think it has that facility. So I'm not yep. bothering it because it's going to be completely replaced. The other thing I would say is um, I prefer not to tell people what I'm planning to do because sometimes <laughs> what you plan doesn't happen, like yep. COVID, in a way. Yeah, yep, that's totally fair, yeah. So I think I'd rather <laughs> wait till I've actually done something and say, hey, by the way, I've done this. <laughs> yeah, cool. Instead of, don't mind me not telling you then. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I, I suppose instead of that, where could, uh, if people want to listen to some of your music, some of your albums, where can they find those? <clears throat> well, there's quite a lot. If, if they go on the, on, the, on the internet and type in France Elul, as long as they get the, the spelling right, <clears throat> I'll spell my name in case people yeah. want to. My name, France. Imagine you're um, a cross channel swimmer right, and you swim across the English Channel and you bumped your head on the shoreline, where would the, what, what is the name of that country? It would be your name. <laughs> exactly. It's France, yeah. R-A-N-C-E. -E. No other spelling. F-R-A-N-C-E. -E. <clears throat> and my surname, I'll use the, um, the, the international, you know, um, aviation thingy. Yeah. E, e for echo. L for Lima, L for Lima again, U for uniform, and L for Lima again. So E double L U L. Thank you very much to Franz Elul for joining me. We're going to listen to another one of his tunes now, and this is Eleanor Plunkett.
in the future. You'll be able to watch TV on your microwave. 3D print yourself a personal butler. You rang mom? And get fit by just looking at a treadmill. OK, maybe not that. But wherever the technology does go, radio will go there too. Because Radio Player is working with the world's leading car and tech companies to keep radio out in front. Radio Player. In the car, in the home, in the future. Find out more at radioplayer.org. Someone jogging, walking their dog or working out in the park is highly likely to have COVID-19. This is a national health emergency. Around one in three people have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. So exercise locally. If you're on your own, you can meet one other person. But keep your distance. Exercise, don't socialize. And wash your hands the moment you get home. Stop the spread. Stick to the rules. If you bend the rules, people will die. Stay home. Protect the NHS. Save lives. Wanderer by Clive Whitelock and before that we had Eleanor Plunkett by Franz Elol. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. I'm your host Dane Cobain and we've reached that part of the show where we head over to Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for this week's album review. So over to Twanglin' Jack. When I was looking for something new to talk about I went to one of my usual sources for strange stuff and that is the Freak Show, the Stuart McConey Six Music Programme which is on 8 o'clock on a Sunday evening. So I turned on the radio and immediately I heard this choir, gospel choir, and a guy playing this melodic trumpet on top of it. And uh, I could tell it wasn't Miles Davis, which is the only other trumpet player I'd recognise. So I waited till the end and uh, Stuart McConey said it was A New Perspective by Donald Byrd, recorded in 1963. So, I bought the album, and it is really nice. It's another one of these jazz for people who don't like jazz. Uh, it's the most notable other performer on it that anyone might have heard of. It's got Herbie Hancock on it. But it is a very nice record, and I listen to it in my van as I'm driving, and it chilled me out wonderfully. Jazz. Thank you very much to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Franz Allor for joining us as this week's guest, as well as to everyone who shared music. I'm going to leave you with one last song, but in the meantime, as always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You can also listen on Catch Up on buzzsprout.com, as well as iTunes, Spotify, all other good normal places you might listen to your uh, podcasts. And, uh, yeah, you can also email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. 
So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is from a previous guest on our show, actually. This is Fabulous Parfait with Sugar Mice. I'll see you next week. I was flicking through the channels on the TV on a Sunday in Milwaukee in the rain Trying to piece together conversations Trying to find out where to lay the blame But when it comes right down to it there's no use trying to pretend for when it gets right down to it, there's no one here that's left to blame. Blame it on me. Blame it on me. We just sugar mice in the rain. I had Sinatra. Calling me down through the floorboards Where you pay a quarter For a partnership in rhyme To the jukebox Crying in the corner While the waitress Is counting out the time For when it gets right down to it There's no use Trying to pretend For when it gets right down to it There's no one here that's left to blame Blame it on me Oh, you can blame it on me We just sugar mice in the rain Cause I know what I feel, know what I want, I know what I am Daddy took a rain check Cause I know what I want, know what I feel, I know what I need Your daddy took a rain check left to blame but me blame it on me blame it on me well the toughest thing that I ever did was talk to the kids on the phone when I heard them asking questions I knew that you were all can't you understand that the government left me out of work? I just couldn't stand the looks on their faces saying, what a jerk. So if you want my address, it's number one at the end of the bar. Where I sit with the broken angels, clutching at straws and nursing all scars. Blame it on me. You can blame it on me Sugar mice in the rain This is Wickham Sound 